So I would like to introduce Dr. Louis Ng from Singapore for the second talk of the day. He's a consultant in Department of Anesthesiology and Chairman Hospital Transfusion Committee in Changi General Hospital. He also holds academic position as a clinical assistant professor, Duke NUS, Singapore. He also actively pursues his interest in trauma, anesthesiologist, and point of care device, guided blood management, clinically and academically. Currently, he leads the operating theater blood services and coordinates education in surgical intensive care unit. Please welcome Dr. Louis Ng. Over to you. Okay, so today my topic is on the importance of analgesia and trauma, uh, something that we do commonly as anesthesiologists as well as, in, as intensive care uh, practitioner in the ICU. Uh, probably something that's extremely uh, important in the management of trauma, yet uh, frequently overlooked, especially in the management of a critically ill patient who's actually dying on the spot. So as a disclaimer, I'm an anesthetist, I'm an intensivist, uh, and also the hospital transfusion committee chairman. I have uh, received some honorarium on uh, speaking for Octopharma in terms of PCC, fibrinogen concentrate, as well as for Rotem. But otherwise, I have no other conflicts of interest. The content of my talk will be touching on, one, the introduction to the importance of pain management in trauma patients, the basic pathophysiology of stress response to pain, the long-term consequences uh, to pain itself, and how we manage pain in uh, trauma. So why is pain management in trauma important? I think this article uh, summarizes it quite well. Many of our trauma patients have massive injuries and most of them has moderate and severe pain as a result of their injury or the trauma itself. It, considered, it, con it contributes significant stress to the patient, causes a lot of uh, response in terms of physiological as well as neuroendocrine. It creates a uh, psychological distress to the patient and uh, if not well managed, it can lead to a lot of impact, uh, leading to increased uh, incidence of uh, chronic pain in uh, many patients, as well as affect quality of life and reduce the ability to function post uh, trauma in many of these patients. So we touch on the, what is the main side effects of pain. Stress response to trauma, the amplitude of uh, injury increases the amplitude of stress response to the trauma itself. And it's actually amplified by the presence of pain. A direct injury has stress reaction from endothelial damage to blood loss to the activation of coagulation, cascade, cascade to the uh, triggering of the sympathetic response to stress response. But in the presence of pain, all these are then amplified in many ways. So what are the stress responses we are talking about? We are talking about mainly neuroendocrine responses with the activation of the HBA axis as well as sympathetic response. This slide kind of uh, summarizes what happens when the patient has pain. Uh, from, the, from the stimulant of pain, uh, the HBA axis is activated. It leads, to many it leads to secretions of many agents that has direct or indirect uh, impact on the neuroendocrine response of this patient. And the one that manifests the most acutely is that of catecholamines with a sympathetic response leading to tachycardia, hypertension, stress response with pain, a patient in distress. And of course, at the same point in time that, not, that we should not underestimate is the release of cortisol level, aldosterone, the release of ADH, which has long-term impact pathophysiologically, especially when we look at patients in ICU. Okay? The end organ effect, to summarize the very busy slide just now, is that we have increased oxygen demand, increased cardiac output in terms of the cardiovascular response. There's higher risk of ischemia and injury and a higher risk of arrhythmia with the, uh, with the efflux of uh, huge amounts of catecholamines. There is an increased need for oxygen consumption. There's a higher uh, CO2 production. We've increased workload to increase the supply and the circulation of blood and oxygen through the body. In the GI part, there's a higher risk of ileus. In fact, we know that the risk of ileus in many of these patients are, uh, are, are, are pretty prevalent and there also has increased risk of gastric stasis, which we all know about. And uh, in the endocrinological-wise, uh, sugar control in a lot of these patients in pain and trauma is actually dysregulated because of stress response from cortisol as well as sympath uh, sympathetic stimulation. Immunologically, long-term uh, uncontrolled stress response simply dis 
disregulate the Im immune system. And this has long-term impact on wound healing, gut mobility, as well as, well, as, well as maintenance of glycocalyx in the patient. Metabolic-wise, we know there's increased catabolism, and hematological-wise, there's increased thrombotic risk because of the stress response. Part and parcel of the fight and flight response to preserve life, which in the long term uh, creates an adverse event that uh, reduces the chance of recovery of a patient. Other consequences of poly pain, poly managed pain includes psychological distress, PTSD, which is present in more in up to hundred percent of the patients that that have experienced a massive major trauma, and this was uh, from studies in the uh, in the in, in in first world countries in US and UK from the all the patients that had come through the war torn uh, areas. There's negative impact on function and recovery with a negative impact on length of stay in institution when pain is poorly managed. There's also the risk of development of chronic pain syndrome, which is actually under-recognized in many situations in many countries and also under-reported by many patients. There's a prolonged lower quality of life post-trauma with many patients that are suffering in pain silently, uh, which is actually all part of uh, part and parcel of poorly managed pain. So how do we then manage pain? First, what the first thing we need to do is to recognize pain. Recognition of pain is not so simple because pain is extremely personal and extremely subjective. There are many, many skills of measuring pain in different settings. None of it is perfect, and many of which do not always take into the functional impact of pain, especially in an acute situation or in a chronic situation. Okay? And in a semi-conscious that's critically ill, it's even harder for us to assess pain because we will be distracted by the need to preserve life. Uh, and uh, that can, that in a certain sense is a gray area of conflict that uh, we as intensivists or anesthesiologists or the trauma surgeon or the trauma practitioner have to deal with when we manage someone who's very ill, uh, yet suffering from major trauma. So if you look at this slide, this is probably the one of the most common skills that we learn to manage pain. This is known as a visual analog skill where we look at this and rate the patient, rate pain from zero to 10, from zero no pain to that of the most uh, painful pain they can ever imagine. And the smiley face then correlates to the severity of pain. And when we adapt it to a more complicated instance, like in this uh, defense and veterans pain skill rating, we take into account some of the function whether it can bear the pain, whether pain distracts them, and whether they can actually function with the pain on top of the usual VAS scores that we use. And in the critical care setting, it's even more complicated. You have patients that's ventilated, sedated, but that doesn't mean they do not experience pain. Looking at facial expressions, looking at body movements, looking at ventilator desynchronies, and looking at muscle tensions, those are stuff that uh, we are attempting to look at but not always successful in diagnosing pain in many of our critically ill patients. And thus, I mean, we can understand that giving, making, managing pain in these patients are pretty complicated, okay? So then we touch on this topic about fear of giving analgesia. So in any patients that are sick, have major trauma, that has a major hemodynamic stability, instability, that we are worried about conscious state because of major uh, head injury, or worry about respiratory distress. Should we then deal with pain? Should we then provide analgesia or not? So that becomes a kind of ethical conflict as we manage these patients. Uh, there are many articles that actually propose pain to be treated as the fifth vital sign, something as important as ABC. Uh, and that is to be taken with a uh, 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 major importance when we want to manage a lot of these patients. Uh, when we manage a patient that's sick, Pain control or the effort to offer comfort should not be compromised just because we are uh, totally engrossed in managing the, the life-saving procedure. Of course, we shouldn't ignore the X, A, B, C, D, E in keeping the patient alive, but pain control should also be initiated. A balanced approach is probably needed, but yet at the same time, many of the times, even me, uh, we are guilty of not have pay attention to pain when we are resuscitating a patient. We are so engrossed in doing the airway, breathing, circulation, even the morning groaning patient. The first thing we do is sucks, fentanyl, intubate. And then once we just keep quiet, let's do the rest. Do we have sedation on board? Not all the time. We run a bit of deaths. Do we have painkiller on board? We, sometimes we don't run it because in the rush of doing a lot of things, we forget. But is it correct for these patients? We do not truly know. It's probably not right if this patient can wake up and tell us that they are in pain. But let's think about it uh, when we manage all our patients in future. So 
we will talk about managing pain in acute setting in patients with severe pain. WHO ladder has a very nice ladder that teaches us how to manage, to, to manage pain in the escalating fashion. But in patients with severe and acute pain, we know that uh, using the normal ladder is not sufficient. In fact, there are many articles that propose the reverse WHO ladder as the, as the gold standard in managing pain, starting with strong operas and then supplementing with other uh, analgesics to help with pain management. And believe it or not, I think this is probably the appropriate way to deal with pain. And we know it from our experience that when patients are in severe pain, we will start with the WHO ladder, giving paracetamol more than N6 and then tramadol. It's not going to be useful for a lot of these patients. They're screaming in pain, they're in severe distress. What they need is very strong objects. Oxynom, morphine, fentanyl, even remy fentanyl for some of these patients. That's the only thing that actually relieve them from the distress and stress. Pain control in ED and OT. How do I personally manage pain? Of course, priority comes first, keeping the patient alive. Primary surveys, damage control, resuscitation, X, A, B, C, D, E, with paying attention to disability management and uh, 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 and temperature management, and then not forgetting, we need to provide analgesia for this patient. Patient in severe pain and complex trauma need to have secure, need to have the airway secure. If you are in doubts of the airway, if you are conflicted over the need to worry about airway protection, worry about respiratory distress, you have to use drugs for to provide comfort. My take is just secure the airway. Get it done, get it out of the way, we do the rest, confirm this patient is safe, get the scans done, and then we can extubate this patient in comfort and safety. Ketamine is actually my best friend in patients with any hemodynamic stability. It provides good hemodynamic stability in uh, all kinds of scenario, be head injury or that of a bleeding patient. It provides dissociative analgesia so that we can do procedures on the spot. It's a sedative. It allows me to intubate the patient. It has uh, cognitive uh, uh, impairment effects, which allows me to take away the memory or the bad memories of this patient that can cause nightmares in the future. It can be safely used in neurotrauma, as I mentioned before, and it's as close to perfect IV anesthetics, in my opinion, where it can provide all the modalities you are interested in. Analgesia, anesthesia, a bit of muscle relaxation, and a bit of anesthesia. That's something that I usually do in my practice, supplemented with a bit of DDES, and so far that has been the gold standard that I have been approaching for all my major trauma patients. Of course, the other way that I do things is sometimes if the patient has some issues that I cannot control and I have doubts about my ketamine or my ketamine is not strong enough, high dose fentanyl or how, like how people run cardiac anesthesia is the other way that it can provide strong, good sedative and analgesic effects in a patient that's highly unstable in a very challenging setting. And when things are stabilized and things are much more uh, uh, controlled, we can then think about oxynom and morphine to provide a bit more longer acting effects after the acute phase of pain control. What can we learn from the lesson from war? I quote this article from uh, David Beard uh, from the Afghan wars. We know upright based analgesia alone may not always be adequate, especially in major trauma. And we know that even from our limited experience uh, in the Asia setting, we may not have gone to major wars in Afghanistan, uh, but we do have enough conflicts in our region that our own uh, fellow practitioners in the Asia settings have their own experience in managing pain. During recovery uh, or in the more uh, controlled phase, a reverse WHO ladder seems appropriate. And in complex trauma, there is extremely high incidence of neuropathic pain. And we have to pay attention in managing all these pains once the acute issues are sorted out. Uh, institution of uh, initiation of a good trauma service is actually of paramount importance with early referral, consideration of multi-modality pain management, the use of uh, more and more regional anesthesia, regional anesthetic techniques, as well as uh, protocols for follow-up, uh, getting uh, physiotherapy, auto uh, I mean, what's that? occupational therapy early, all this will aid in functional recovery of this patient, not just in moderating pain, but as well as improving their functional quality of life. Pain control in an ICU and out of ICU outside OT is as complicated as it is uh, at the start of the trauma management. IV fentanyl and morphine are probably the most common modalities in my ICU. Operate sparing analgesic like dexmethamphetamine, Prisidex, or non other non operate analgesics like Tramadol, like Paracetamol, are things that we regularly use in the in our patients. N6 can be used too, 
But uh, in the ICU settings where patients frequently have uh, renal dysfunction, it may not always be the first choice or even considered in a lot of these patients. When my patients are awake, a PCA should be considered, and I will usually consider PCA, be it uh, oxygen, fentanyl, or morphine. Uh, it doesn't truly matter. It gives the patients some sense of control, which allows them then to uh, have some control over an event they can actually have absolutely no control over. Nerve block catheters are some are uh, quite frequently employed in my hospital. Uh, our hospital does about 13,000 to up to 20,000 nerve blocks a year and uh, some uh, and, and a fair amount of it happens in trauma patients. It may not always be major trauma but a lot of our trauma patients do get nerve blocks or nerve catheters inserted uh, to aid in uh, analgesics. Uh, in my opinion, I think nerve block catheters are extremely useful especially in managing complex pain in patients who needs to be weaned off sedation or ventilator. Running on high dose uh, opioids actually kind of uh, defeats the purpose or runs counterpoint to the need to uh, mobilize this patient and liberate from the ventilator. Of course, the other thing is early definitive surgery. We have patients that are in ICU for a long time. We need to think about what surgeries can we employ that will reduce pain and get these patients mobilized. In. Uh, it has to be an ongoing conversation all the time with all our surgeons so that we can plan all the definitive sur surgeries within as short a period, but as reasonable a period as possible, so that we can get these patients on the recovery phase as soon as possible. Early gabapentinoids in complex pain, like uh, pigabalin, is something that we employ all the time. And of course, we have a very we have a very close working relationship with our acute and chronic pain services. And we do have key room chat when we have patients that we, it's hard to handle. We talk about what options are available. And we have a huge team of uh, physiotherapists that uh, aid us in mobilizing our patients as early as possible. Uh, with early referral for OTs as well as psychological support from our uh, uh, counseling services uh, to, to help negate or reduce the side effects of pain in many of these patients. So let me quickly run through the, region, the, 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 the advantages and the role of regional anesthesia or analgesia in trauma. There are many advantages of regional anesthesia or analgesia in trauma, of which one, we know that when the pain block is working very well, the amount of systemic or process sedative needed is a lot less. So it's associated side effects, of which what we are fearful of is ventilator associated uh, issues like inability to win off uh, sedation or ventilator or ileus for the matter. It helps us uh, liberate a patient earlier from ventilator. It allow us more to mobilize the patient faster because of the uh, <clears throat> more cooperation from the patient who's uh, less sedated because of the need to deal with pain. Uh, earlier and more proactive participation in physiotherapy, reduction in ileus and gastric stasis. Uh, there are quite it's quite well known that uh, pain blocks or at least nerve blocks reduce the incidence and development of chronic pain syndromes. And that's what we employ our nerve blocks quite frequently from. And we know that with patients that is well blocked, generally have better satisfaction scores. And hopefully this will reduce the amount of PTSD these patients uh, suffer from when they post, uh, when they have uh, poor, when they recover from this initial injury. And in patients, in some groups of patients, there's history of abuse from drugs. Uh, regional anesthesia is actually extremely useful because the amount of opioids they need uh, is sometimes ridiculous. And uh, uh, then those are some of the uh, advantages of RA. So, however, we can talk about all the good things about RA, but there are definitely a disadvantage of regional anesthesia. One, uh, regional anesthesia is extremely uh, subjective. Uh, on the practitioner. We need very skilled operators and we need established services to follow up and manage all these things. It's generally not used as acute pain management of initial uh, uh, recipient of this patient because our damage control research takes priority. Positioning of any regional anesthesia can be challenging because the patients may not always be in, able to turn in the position for us to uh, put in the catheter or even insert any blocks for the matter. And there's always a perennial issue about under diagnosing or misdiagnosing compartment syndromes, especially in acute pain uh, uh, scenarios or when patients have acute fractures. And of course, the worry about double crush effect, where we worry about the LA toxicity together with hypotension and initial injuries do increase the risk of uh, nerve, uh, nerve neuropathies in the long run. But saying which, the ma many things has changed along the way since regional anesthesia uh, come about. 
there are a lot more techniques that has been employed that are more feasible nowadays as compared to previously. In the thorax, we previously we are talking about mostly epidural. Now we have power vertebral blocks, we have erectile spinal blocks, we have fluid candidates can be placed by a thoracic surgeon. In the abdomen, again, long time ago, uh, uh, we are only talking about epidural blocks. But nowadays we can talk about rectal shape, a transabdominalist plane block, a paravert, and again an ESP block. Uh, it can be, uh, uh, has been explored, has been shown to be very useful in all these patients. Upper limb and lower limbs, there are many nerve blocks now that are ongoing and upcoming. They are more regionalized, more targeted, and reduce the side effects of all the uh, nerve blockades that will help with the pain uh, control. And uh, even posterior spine, anyone, someone coming for a major spine surgery, an ESP block can actually reduce the amount of pain uh, these patients are uh, experienced. Of course, when we talk about pain, it's not always about pharmacological and biological uh, treatment. There are also other kinds of treatment, be it uh, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, TENS, acupuncture, immobilization, hot and copex. But of course, these are things that is not always practiced in uh, many of the intensive care settings because of the inability of a patient to cooperate. Uh, and some of these things, obvious, like obviously, as acupuncture, may not be always be acceptable in many institutions because they are not exactly in the first line or legally accepted in some of the settings. Uh, in summation, uh, as I conclude my talk, I think pain should be fully recognized the fifth vital sign, and appropriate analgesia should not be overlooked even in unstable trauma patients. Systemic opioids should serve as the first line and the main analgesia of choice. MNDA, antagonists, gabapentinoids, non steroids all have their roles in systemic analgesia. And the role of regional anesthesia is actually developing and uh, moving very fast. It offers many benefits and it reduces the side effect from the systemic opioids and other systemic sedation and analgesics. And it should be something that we consider at the back of our mind and something that we should be looking forward into as we progress in our uh, trauma management all over the world. And pain management should continue even on discharge of these patients from our IC or from the acute care setting. And appropriate pain management should also be considered as a vital part of our end of life care, especially in trauma, because uh, at the end of the day, no one should die in pain. Okay, and that will conclude my talk. Thank you.